Well, hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and thank you so much for joining me today on the Friday Masterclass, where today we are back together, solo, just you and I, talking about mixing sound, one of my, uh, one of my true passions, and something that we haven't done yet in this very long series of masterclasses that we've been doing. I want to remind everyone that we're coming across multiple networks today, so hello to everyone across YouTube, Adobe Live, Behance, LinkedIn, and the Twitter. It's great to see you all. So we've got a lot of stuff to cover. This is going to be uh, a multi-part sort of edition of this uh, of these master classes. Also, uh, by the way, a big shout out to our friends at No Film School who are tuning in as well. And uh, today we're really going to sort of take a, a broader look at mixing audio in Premiere Pro using a combination of the track mixer as well as the essential sound panel. And we'll probably focus more on the latter simply because that's that's really the easiest way to get started with mixing. Now, throughout the course of this, I'm going to be kind of dropping little bits of info here specific to some of the more classic workflows. And like all things in Adobe products, there's always multiple ways to do the same operation. Case in point, you can mix manually with the track mixer, or if you kind of want an automated, sometimes AI-assisted uh, mixing, uh, mixing assistant, huh? then you can use the Essential Sound Panel, also known as the ESP, although no one ever says that, and I don't know why. It's such a fun acronym. In any case, a couple of shout outs as always. LinkedIn user. <laughs> Key met G, Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim Hajo, great to see you. Jamea Anis, we enjoy every day. Kurt Thurston, Mohammed Jawad Alam, Angela Walker, Basic Basic, Mark Andre, Samar Afzal, great to see you. Well, I'm gonna, this is a difficult one. Uh, Sparrow Elvens Yaud Viviano, nice to see you as well. Reverb Mike, Tim, Eugene, Theo, Theo, Rick Adams, Mr. Singh, Stephanie, and Rick, great to see you all. Okay, so, uh, Let's go ahead and get into it. Oh, of course, before I do, a couple quick reminders here. Um, if you want to be in the chats that are directly in front of my face, zzz, this is the one that you want to be at. Of course, no film school and LinkedIn. I'm watching you uh, through the other side of my face. <laughs> I need more caffeine or something. Um, B.net slash Adobe Live. That way we can see who's watching on Behance and Adobe Live. And we'd love to have you do that and comment. And uh, of course, we're going to have lots of little things going on today. So, you know, I'll, I'll answer your questions as we can get to them. Uh, but why don't we get right into it? So I'm going to switch over to Premiere Pro. All right. Just like that. And here we are. What's up, Clarice and Jose Rivera and Ibrar and Magnus and Ivan and Ishmael and Noel from Charlotte, North Carolina. How's it going? Thank you so much for chiming in and love that we are back on LinkedIn. By the way. Side note, because, you know, I'm very honest with you. I had assumed we'd been streaming to LinkedIn this whole time, and it was just very quiet. Apparently, some of the events didn't actually show up on LinkedIn for a very long time. So I'm glad it has somehow uh, been re-released. Oh, and one more thing before I begin. I just want to I just want to share this with you because we're back together alone. You know, the last couple of weeks I've had guests and it's really nice to have guests and it's really nice to just do it alone. So thank you. Um, I've mentioned in the past that uh, when I started my career in sort of professional music and in the, in the music industry, I was an audio engineer for well over a decade. And my mentor was uh, someone named Roger Nichols, who if you know anything about audio, if you know, you know, Roger Nichols, nine time Grammy winner, largely for engineering, best engineered records. He was responsible for all of Steely Dan's records. Um, Truly one of the greatest eng recording engineers of all time. He was my mentor. Uh, he used to refer to me often as his illegitimate son. <laughs> he was a friend. Uh, he was everything to me. And uh, he passed away a little over a decade ago, but I've kept in touch with his family because we are very close. And um, while I can't talk about exactly any specifics, we are working on a project that hopefully may come to fruition sometime in the near future. And his uh, one of his daughters recently sent me a shirt. I'm just going to show you here. So this... Uh, you can see it, Wendell Labs. Now, if you know, you know. Do you know what Wendell is? I want to hear in the chat. If you know what Wendell is, you can kind of get an idea just by looking at it. Um, I'll tell you in a few seconds if no one asks or answers. Does anyone know? How much of an audio nerd are you really? That's, that's what we're testing here. But exciting stuff, potentially happening. It's great to be sort of working with his family again. And... Uh, I just can't tell you enough and emphasize enough how much this man uh, changed my life. Uh, 
in every conceivable way. He was not only an incredible mind, the inventor of so much of the digital technology that we know today in audio, um, but also just a really wonderful human being. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he was, uh, he was something else. So I talked about him a lot, but wearing this shirt today, I don't know, it just gives me, gives me the feels. CT oh no no oh thank you so much my friend yeah uh, you know he was he was just wonderful okay so um, oh and hey Misty what's up all right so here we are in Premiere Pro this is a project uh, I've used on a couple of other master classes over time it's called Two Step and uh, so I did not create this these are assets that I'm using someone else's production but it has kind of all the elements of your uh, basic you know, mixed to pictures. We've got dialogue, we have the need for some ambient sound. I actually added in some music, some my own, some uh, royalty-free via um, uh, our uh, Adobe Stock audio. And this is currently unmixed, all right? So first we're just gonna take a listen to kind of hear what it sounds like in its essentially raw form. Now, some of this audio has been replaced, also known as ADR, dialogue replacement. Some of it is directly on set. And you'll know that because you can hear a certain level of kind of ambient sound to it. Um, in fact, there's even a, a moment where one of the actors kind of leans in a bit and you can hear just, you know, however they were doing the boom, they didn't really move with him. So it, it gets sort of a little bit noticeably clearer and louder, which isn't a bad thing, but maybe better booming next time. But in any case, you're going to get to kind of hear it raw. And then we're going to start to break this down and treat it in a number of different ways. And again, I'm first gonna kind of show you some of the traditional things I might do in the track mixer, but then ultimately we're gonna focus on this, which is essential sound, all right? Now, next week we're gonna be talking about sound design. That's a little bit different. Okay, that's like sound effects. And again, adding a lot of room ambience and, and, and processing to things. This is really kind of a, a basic overview of mixing and then the week after that, we're doing something around exporting, and then we're going to come back again and really dive a lot deeper into sort of classic mixing, which you can do very capably in Premiere Pro without ever leaving Premiere Pro. So, you know, again, in a professional environment, what does that mean anymore? A lot of times you'll send out the audio. I love this phrase. You'll send it out. What does that mean anymore? Um, but you do, you know, you'll take all your tracks and you'll give it to somebody else who will often do that mix in Pro Tools or somewhere else. And you can still do that. We have ways to do it. The key here is you can really do everything in Premiere. I mean, there are some limitations in its mixer and where it has those limitations, you can then augment that with Audition if you want to stay in the sort of Adobe ecosystem. But Premiere is a very capable mixer. Um, it works well, it can be automated, there's lots of functionality here. So we're going to touch on some of that, but also highlight kind of the AI-assisted essential sound panel. All right, let's take a quick listen to this scene here. I'm going to put on headphones so that you don't get uh, any bleed, and uh, take a listen. But Wayne, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. Amy just, she split and took it all. She... If I talked to Amy, she came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional. And you're what they call can't win for losing. She tell you she took it all? She took the whole damn score? What she did is she paid me what she owed me for her half. And then you go pay me. But I, don't, I didn't get any of the money. Why, why do I have to pay you if I don't get any of it? Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. You just lost it. And that ain't my fault. Besides, I gave you the tools, I gave you the phones, I gave you the scripts, I told you what to do, and I told you how to do it. But I don't have the money. But I don't care. All right, good place to stop. By the way, where I, where I was leaning in right there, and he says, and I told you how to do it. You, you can hear he's like getting closer to the boom mic. Yeah, which again is, there's nothing wrong. It's just, if I were holding it, you, you kind of move with him so that it maintains the same distance and ambience and all that. Are most people gonna give a hoot? No. This is just me being a super audio nerd. By the way, I love this scene. These actors are awesome. This is not a slight on anybody. I'm just, I'm just pointing out some of those things. Okay, by the way, I see some answers were coming in. Angela was saying was Wendell recording software. A Couple of people are saying recording software. So Wendell, if you can still see, was the original drum computer. Now, a lot of people think of sort of drum 
drum machines like the Lin drum. So Roger predated the Lin drum by a couple of years, actually worked with Roger Lin as well. That's another story. But he created the Wendell, and the Wendell would ultimately provide the drum samples on Steely Dan's Gaucho, um, and was also able to not only be programmed manually, again, we're talking like 1979, 1980 here, um, but could also be used as a drum trigger system using 16-bit, 50 kilohertz sampled drum sounds. And it was just amazing. And if you want to hear exactly what it sounds like, okay, there's dozens and dozens of albums that used it. Steely Dan's Gaucho is all Wendell. And it's, it's, just, it's just something else. And it, again, it won Grammy for Best Engineered Record. And among other things, it was this technology. And Roger, it was all, it was all him. I mean, he invented this stuff. He invented stuff in the 70s. Now, again, digital had already come about. You know, I think I've talked about in previous streams, Polar Studios in Sweden, very famously, the first sort of digital studio. ABBA being one of the first bands to actually leverage all of this in the, in the, um, the time where we used to refer to recordings as DDD or ADD or AAD. Again, not attention deficit disorder. That meant analog recording, digital mixing, digital processing. Um, Roger had done so much of this work in conceiving and conceptualizing digital mixing boards, digital microphones, which effectively are kind of what USB mics are today in the 1970s. Uh, you know, they, they, they called him the immortal, and there was a reason for that, because his mind was, like many of the greats out there, just, just beyond, you know, <laughs> beyond a, a, a human understanding. And again, I feel like the kid who got the golden ticket because he shared so much of this knowledge with me. Okay, Jose Bustos, yes, Jose knows. Bang the drum slowly, Rupert Mike. I believe, actually, in fact, uh, you know, his samples were used on some Todd Rundgren records as well, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> anyway, so cool. All right. So as we listen to this, you know, ultimately, it's not bad. It's a pretty decent mix. Um, obviously, we could probably do a little bit of ducking, kind of right ducking some of that creepy music underneath the dialogue to make it a little bit more present. We could also probably start using some compression and adding clarity kind of to push that dialogue forward. You know, the main thing is in a, in a scene like this, where it's obviously fairly tense, when you're in a theater in particular, right, you, you really want to hear, you want to hear all those elements as they're speaking. You want to hear nervousness. You want to hear almost the glottal, those sounds, I'm doing it up to my boom here, um, because it creates tension, right? So in order to do that, you have to add things like compression and limiting and other things. So this is, this is where we're going to sort of start today. Now, before we get into actually compression, first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to mute uh, the music tracks here. All right. And if we go over to the mixer, a couple things to note. So first of all, just like with Photoshop, when I, when I go through my timelines, and this I actually kind of reorganize this timeline from the original editor, first thing I'll do is, you know, I'll try and separate the dialogue by person on individual tracks. So if you look here, everything is color coded. So track one, A1 here represented in purple. Track one is represents the two characters, Webb and Dwayne. So there were a couple clips where they didn't do dialogue replacement. They did sort of on set sound. And it's not even that they're both talking at the same time, but there might be just kind of a, like a, hmm, you know, just there, there's like sound together in this short piece. So I put that on its own track because we're going to treat that separately. Um, the following track, oh, and it looks like I missed two of my labels. Good job, doofus, uh, is this character, Webb, who's on the right. So I'm going to color code those all rows. <laughs> Jeez Louise, be consistent. All right, do that. And track three here, uh, represented in cerulean blue, that's Dwayne, all right? This is just going to make your life a lot easier, right? And similarly, inside of the track mixer, I label everything. Now, you can leave everything. I think that it just defaults to track one, track two, whatever. But just like with layers in Photoshop, it's just a, it's a nightmare if you don't label it, right? Now, you're not going to have, you know, 600 uh, channels of audio. I pray you don't. If you do, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> That's a blanket statement. You're doing it wrong. There's too many tracks. Combine a little. That's just nonsense. Um, not that you can't. Actually, I don't even know what the track limit is. 
for certain it's at least 99. Really though, this is, you know, <laughs> it's just unnecessary. You can actually have a lot more tracks once you start creating things like submixes and groups. That's understandable, but you get my point. Anyway, you got to label, you got to name things. It behooves, one of my favorite words, it really behoo it helps you. It's only going to make the process of mixing and identifying where sound lives. Because remember, I'm sure you've seen, like we do Timeline Tuesdays. When you see the audio mix of even, you know, the commercial spots or some of these SNL things, shorts, I see, you know, because they use Premiere and they often do Timeline Tuesdays. I mean, there are way more audio bits many times than video bits and they're strewn across all different tracks and you got to know where this stuff is. You know, I, I see a lot of times and I, I'm, it's not guilty of doing it. Sometimes I'll do it too. I'll just have one piece of sound design, some kind of a whoosh that's unlike all the other whooshes. And because I want to treat that with a particular effect, it lives on its own track. Again, it's easy to expand that track count. If I don't have that labeled, good luck eyeballing it because when you kind of just, you know, even show the full 30 seconds, it's just, it's just a gazillion little cuts, right? And yes, we have 16 labels, but ultimately it's going to get, you know, a little bit difficult to locate all of those. True Time is asking, can you ask questions about 5.1? You may, in fact. Um, we're not going to be doing 5.1 today, but go ahead. Uh, let's see. Tech Jane is, oh, is Jane saying something about LinkedIn? Can't push a play button to start the class again? I don't know. That's interesting. Oh, so it only plays live? Strange. Tim Kivy, this is brilliant. Thank you, Benjamin from Ghana. Very hello, a uh, very welcome hello to you. Karen Brisa, great to see you. Whiskey, great to see you, Fahed and Riza. Okay, so labeling, getting things together. All right, the other thing that I highly recommend doing is, you know, the, the faders all start at zero. Now, dialogue in particular, and you know, I, this is the, the school of thought, I don't even know if there's a school anymore because the, the, the standards have just kind of changed not even a standards. It's just the way people do it. Having everything at zero and then playing everything without doing anything, you run the risk of already over modulating or just having too much sound. All right. You really almost never want your fader to be at zero because there's other ways to treat the amplitude of a particular clip. So in general, I'll just start kind of a blanket minus three across all faders. Now, one might say, well, why three? Well, three decibels down, again, it's just gonna give you a little bit of headroom because remember, as you start adding dialogue on top of dialogue, I always use like the Photoshop concept. You know, so you have multiple pieces of dialogue, then you have ambient sound, then you have music, then you have, you know, momentary room tone. As you continually add, all of that ultimately affects your master level. And when we're mixing today digitally, we're working in what's known as a negative logarithmic scale. So actually, and this is again, a little bit of a little bit of schooling for you if you're unfamiliar with audio, you may have noticed that on our faders in the tracks here. So on the left side, this is actually sort of an analog re representation of decibels where zero is right here. You see that? So this kind of represents zero dB uh, in the an whoops, in the analog domain. And then up here you have 15. This is standard sort of on analog mixing consoles where you have about 15 decibels of, of headroom. That 15 decibels, however, it's actually a little bit more, is technically zero dB full scale because we are mixing digitally. We're not mixing in the analog domain, which means that zero <laughs> is as loud as you can get. That's full program loudness zero dB FS full scale. And depending upon how you're metering and what bit depth you're working in, in this case, let's just say 16 bit or technically 24 bit, negative infinity or minus 140 decibels is the quietest signal, okay? So everything is in this kind of negative logarithmic scale. If that is difficult to understand, we will revisit this. But this is something you have to keep in mind because you don't, if you've ever heard, you know, old school engineers, <laughs> anyone with graying hair talk about, well, in my day, you know, how they used to like, you know, push, push the levels into the red. This is an old concept. You can't do that digitally. I mean, you can, but what happens is it doesn't get warm and beautiful and fat pH sounding. It just starts digitally distorting. 
and you don't want that. So you want to be mindful of that. So by dropping everything to minus 3 dB on the fader, again, we're talking the left side here, a little more traditional, um, it's just going to give you a little bit more room to work with, all right? It's a good starting point. And you can see in some cases, like this other music track, that's the providing some of that really weird, creepy stuff. It, I, I recorded these creepy choirs super hot, very, very loud. So I just dropped that like way down, minus 24, right? This other ADR track, it was recorded very quiet. So I left it a little closer to zero because the amplitude on the track itself before processing was very, very quiet. I, I couldn't even hear it if I dropped it to minus three, minus six. So it's not an absolute rule. But it's a good way when you're getting started, just drop all those faders to around minus three and then begin sort of readjusting, all right? It also kind of keeps you in check when you get to later on down the line in your mixing, you're like, God, why is everything peaking? Why is everything so loud? Well, if you've already attenuated everything in the first place, again, you're, you're giving yourself a little more latitude to work with. No reason you can't do minus six, all right? Minus six works too. Now, if we're talking one dialogue track and one piece of music, make the dialogue minus six. And if the music is like commercial music, you know, if you're using the latest, uh, who did I say just came out with something? Uh, <laughs> there's my knowledge of modern stuff. I don't know, whatever. Beatles Let It Be, it's mixed modern, right? It's, it's loud. If I put that in against dialogue, it's going to be way louder. So I'd probably even have to drop that music more than minus six, okay? It's just a good idea. It's a good practice. You don't have to do it. Do what you want, but it's a good practice. Okay. The slider goes to 11. Yes, Tim. All right, very good. Okay, just checking on some of the questions here. Angela Walker, can you use royalty-free Adobe stock music on YouTube? Looking for ambient background music, but confused by copyright. What decibel level do you recommend for background ambience? Angela, first question. Yes, you absolutely can. That is the whole idea behind Adobe stock. When you license it, you are, you, and you're going through one of our partners, you are in, enabling yourself to use that on YouTube. And it, it actually, there's a process behind the scenes that happens, but yes, you are able to do that. As far as decibel level for recommended background ambience, that's gonna vary based on the scene, based on what it is. And you're gonna see me do a little bit of that in just a couple of moments, all right? <clears throat> okay. Will Engel, oh, I've been wanting to make a video on gain staging. It's so important, incredibly. I think we've talked about this many times, Will. I know, gain staging is, again, we're not gonna talk about that today. This is more on how you capture audio for those just tuning in, right? I just talked about sometimes dialogue is way too quiet. We get a little spoiled in the modern digital domain because we have so much headroom to work with. Some people record things way too hot unnecessarily. Some people record things too quietly. It's about really finding that balance and maximizing the format that you're, that you're recording into. So that will be in another class. Someone else is asking, um, will I be doing a 5.1 masterclass again soon? Uh, maybe, but I have one on my YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Jason Levine video. I believe I have several different episodes in my audio 101 playlist, as well as some others that talk about the 5.1 workflow in Premiere and Audition as well. Okay, so back in the mixer here. We've got everything labeled. We've got our faders dropped. Uh, you know, again, for those of you new, a couple of standard controls here. I'm just, I'm actually going bottom to top. This is in reverse order. Uh, MSR mute, mutes the track. Solo, solos the track. R, if we were recording, doing voiceover directly into the track. We have our pan knob here, all right, left and right in stereo. By the way, I dis, uh, I disabled my noise reduction that I normally run on my mics here because we might be panning some things in stereo. Uh, this is showing your track output assignment. This is showing your track input assignment up at the top here. And then you have this little show hide effects and sends. And this is one of the things that, you know, if you're, if you've never used the track mixer and you're like, well, where, where do I put effects and stuff? How, how come I don't see it? You have to twirl this down. And when you do that, that's going to reveal to you your effects inserts and your effects sends. All right. Now, again, I'm only gonna to touch upon this today because I wanna focus more on essential sound, but we are first going to do a little bit of work in there. Real quickly, what are effects inserts? So this allows you to place an effect directly on a track. And by placing that effect on a track, essentially what the effects insert does is it sends the audio from that track to the, track, to the effect and sends it right back. Simple, okay? In a more traditional mixing environment, 
you inserted really only certain types of effects. You would insert things like a compressor, something that's going to affect the amplitude. You're sending it to the effect and you're sending it right back and you're using the processor to control elements of the amplitude. You would also often insert things like equalization or equalizers. Sometimes maybe you would insert things like tape delay. This could also be used on other, uh, uh, in other formats like groups or submixes. Not gonna touch upon that too much today. Typically you wouldn't insert things like a reverb. You could, but again, it means that you're sending that all that audio to a reverb and then sending it back. And you have no way to really control the reverberated signal and the dry signal because you would have to control it on the device itself. Now, when we're doing this kind of virtually like this, you do have, uh, there's just more ease in controlling the balance of what we call wet signal and dry signal. Dry signal is the original unprocessed signal. Wet signal is the signal with the effect, whatever it is, compression, EQ, reverb, delay, etc. So you can insert, we allow you to insert all of the various effects in Premiere Pro, all right? So this includes things like, again, I talked about compression. So if I wanted to add a compressor, we'll come back to this in a second, or delays and echo, or all of our various equalizers, and there are many of them. And some of these are, they've been in here for a long time. Some of these, frankly, not great. Don't use them. If you want sort of the de facto, what sounds good and what works on kind of, what can you use on anything? It's this one here, the parametric equalizer. Um, FFT filter is wonderful, very specific. I'm not going to touch on that today. Graphic equalizer, you know, this is kind of classic. If you had parents who had the, the little silver, often like Sony EQs on their stereo systems in the 80s and 90s with sliders, 10 bands would mean 10 sliders, 20 bands, 20 sliders, 30 band, 30 sliders. These are fine. They're, they, they sound okay. They're not my favorites. I've talked about this a lot. High pass, low pass. Again, very specific. You have high pass, low pass in the parametric equalizer, and I don't think these sound particularly great. And then you have a bunch of others here, simple parametric, treble, bass. Don't don't use those. They're they're just they're just not good. <laughs> How do I really feel? Use them if you like. But don't. Modulation effects, chorus, flanger, flanger, phaser. Let you hear a little bit of that in a second. Now, here we have like things like noise reduction. Now, this is something you would often, in sort of the modern domain, insert. Something like uh, denoise, right? We want to sort of denoise all of the clips on a certain track, right? Simultaneously, real time, good opportunity to do that here. Now, we're going to do this in Essential Sound, but you could also add a denoiser here. We also have the de-reverb, which as I've discussed in previous uh, uh, live streams is really, it's, it's a, it's an ambience attenuator, right? To say D reverb, I mean, that's, yeah, I guess that's more, you're more likely to understand kind of conceptually what it does, but there are, there are limitations. All right. If you're trying to remove kind of echoey ambience from like, you've been recording in a kitchen or a bathroom or a room that is not sound treated. The D reverb can often, many times, very successfully, just remove some of that harsh reflectivity and ambience. That's a good thing to insert, all right? As mentioned, reverb, and then we have, you know, all these other various effects here, pitch shifting, stereo expansion. All of these things, actually, stereo expansion and pitch shifting makes sense as an insert, right? You want to send a clip all the clips in that track to that pitch shifter, affect them all universally, and then send the signal right back. All right. That's the concept of effects inserts. And you'll see that I already have some inserts on the music. I have some parametric EQ and some reverb on these, uh, on these music tracks here. Again, just to kind of take some of the edge off so they work a little bit better with some of the dialogue. Okay. Now, as we're listening to this dialogue, I want to play some of this back here so you can kind of hear it raw. Someone was just asking about ambient sound. This is kind of an essential part of working with dialogue is preserving some of the ambience. All right. Now, when you do dialogue replacement, part of what makes it work is, yes, you do want it to line up with the lips, right? But you also need to replace the environment that the people are in. 
it's it's a huge mistake to have super clear. You've seen this actually in shows and things. I was just watching an episode of uh, I think it was New Girl, <laughs> and clearly it was a scene where like they had to redo the dialogue, and it was probably you know it's Hollywood, so it's like ah oh, we're late. We got to get this to air back in the you know TV airing days. This is pre Netflix and all that. Oh, we had to do this dialogue replacement. Oh, we don't have time to mix it and get it sounding exact. So there was this scene where like, again, they're in this loft and there is kind of this ambient roomy sound. And then it cuts back to one of the characters. Now the lip, the lip sync was great, but it was so very clearly like done in a, in a studio and they didn't process it. And it just, it takes you out of the whole scene. So part of the thing that you're trying to do when you're mixing dialogue is, you know, obviously, preserving the clarity of the voice, but also in many cases, preserving the ambience. And sometimes you have, to, you have to take the ambience out if it's too much and then put it back in so that you're sort of living in the scene. That's a lot of words. Let's, let's take a listen to what this dialogue sounds like cleanly, all right? And actually, I'm gonna skip ahead a bit because we've got this piece of ADR right down here. And this is gonna be sort of the first feature of this. She tell you she took it all? She took the whole damn score? What she did is she paid me what she owed me for her half. And now you're gonna pay me well, what you owe me. But I didn't get any of the money. Why, why do I have to pay you if I don't get any of it? <laughs> oh, you got it, Webb. You got it. You just lost it. You just lost it. Okay, so right here. Now again, <laughs> Dwayne is off camera here. And he says, you got it, Webb, you got it. And then it cuts to the ambient recording which is clearly the boom mic on Webb, who we see in the shot. And you can hear he's, the character who's in the foreground here is a little further back. It sounds a little more kind of roomy, mid-rangey because he's off mic, right? So the ADR version, which is here. I didn't get any of it. Oh, you got it, Webb. You got it. You just lost it. Webb, you got it. You just lost it. Now, I've, I've already done a little balancing to make it sort of kind of fit. But if you're listening critically, you can tell that it's there's something missing. And what's missing is that we need a little bit more. I left some of the root room tone from the previous clip here. Oh, you got it, Webb. You got it. But we almost need a little bit more. All right. So I'm going to show you this real quickly. This is kind of a, a back and forth workflow. If you don't have room tone, and this is something that we talked about weeks back, when you're on set, and the set could be your room, it could be here, and you're recording yourself or someone else. It is an apps, you must do this. If you're gonna be editing sound, you should always capture 10, 20 seconds of just what the room sounds like when no one's talking. Because in the event that you have to do some tweaking or maybe removing some plosives or, or, or re-EQ or do something a little more drastic, by having that sound of the room, when you put it back underneath the dialogue, Again, it's just going to magically kind of glue things together. Now, you still might need to do a little bit of tweaking, but it just helps to kind of put replaced dialogue back into the exact same environment. Now, can you recreate that with reverb, reverb effects? Absolutely. In fact, I'm probably going to need to do that anyway, just to give it a little bit more ambience. But having kind of the noise, and I do mean the noise of the room, right? The, silence, there's noise in silence, right? is just going to kind of keep you in that scene. So here I have this clip that has some room tone on it. If I just do edit clip in Adobe Audition, all right, and I come over here, all right, and we're in Audition, and I play this back. You just lost it. So right here. Now I'm just gonna amplify this real quickly for a second, because you're probably not hearing it. All right. Now, that's 30 decibels louder. We're not going to leave it 30 decibels, right? It should be 30 decibels quieter. But having that just mm, the little hums, the little zzz, maybe there was some AC. Again, it's not really anything that you perceive in the scene necessarily, especially with music going on. But it's going to help when you do that dialogue replacement to just keep things a little bit more consistent, all right? You're not always going to use it. Sometimes you use it in between speech, not necessarily underneath. Always a good idea to have some room tone. So one easy way to do that is just highlight that section, listen to it, copy it to a new file, all right? 
select the whole thing, because this is like half a second, that's way too short. You're just gonna wind up, you know, like repeating it a million times in Premiere, and that's super annoying. So I'm gonna copy this, go to the end of it, and paste it. Go to the end of it, paste it, go to the end of it, paste it, go to the end of it, paste it. You can even paste in the middle. You know, you could paste any, actually, I even recommend doing that because it's gonna give you slightly more of a randomized kind of feel. So now, now you're not gonna hear this over the stream. Maybe you will. All right. Now we just have some consistent room tone. All right. So again, we can file, save, bring this back into Premiere. Now I already went ahead and did this. I've already got this room tone loop which you can see here, all right? And you can bring this into your tracks and I could place this right about here, all right? Play this back now. Get any of it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. Now again, I don't know how much of that is coming through, but let me just mute this for a second. Here it is without. Get any of it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. You can hear the difference between the ADR and that, again, that off-camera dialogue. Now when I bring this back in. Any of it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. All right. Now the slight differences in amplitude, we're going to fix that with compression. But if you could hear this as clearly, he's now in the same environment, right? And we could even probably attenuate that room tone just a little bit on its own. We can do that just by coming over to the clip here, grabbing our little, uh, oops, you can't see the tool tip there. I'm off screen. Whoops, sorry. Do that again. So there's my little little uh, decibel level here. Probably drop that just about mm, dB and a half, all right? A little more than a dB and a half, all right? Just to make it a little bit smoother. Now, talking about applying effects, let's come back to a couple things here. I'm gonna mute these three tracks talking about insert effects, because then we ought to get to essential sound. All right. On this music that you see here, I have a parametric equalizer and a studio reverb. I'm going to turn these off. By the way, this is your effects bypass in Premiere. All right. And this is what the original music sounded like. Well, actually, you know what? This is Fred Fung. This is not Adobe Stock. This is my buddy Fred. I forgot. Okay. So it's kind of, it's kind of mid-rangey. It's kind of bright. It's kind of a lot in that mid-range where, and I saw Will just made that point. It's in the same range. It's got a lot of the same resonant frequencies as voice, as dialogue. So that means that the dialogue itself is not going to come through very clearly because the music itself is kind of occupying that space. So now I didn't do a scoop out. All right. We'll talk about this more another time. I actually just rolled off pretty harshly. Again, now this is using a low pass filter as part of the parametric equalizer. I can't emphasize enough. As far as native equalization goes inside of Premiere, this is the best one. This is the most musical sounding one. This is the one that sounds the least harsh. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, some EQs just sound a little digital. This one actually has a characteristic of a very warm analog uh, device, which is a good thing works well on vocals and music. And you can see I'm cutting at 30 decibels per octave, everything above 652 hertz. Low pass filter means it allows low frequency to pass through high frequency cut. A high pass filter is the opposite. It allows high frequency to come through and low frequencies are cut, all right? Kind of bit of an opposite there. So if we turn that back on, let's play it again. Let's turn it on. Right? So if I'm trying to talk over this, it's it's so bright, it's in the same range. But if I try and talk over this, well, now my voice just kind of comes through, right? Because I've removed all of that harshness. All right? Simple old school trick. Not even a trick, it's just it's just a technique, okay? And then similarly here, I've got some reverb just to add a little bit of ambience. This may be a little less intelligible, but we're going to come back to it because we're going to do a bit of that on the dialogue now as an insert. So down below, if we unmute this. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. 
All right. And I almost need to adjust the timing. I'm not going to worry about the timing right now. What I am going to do, though, is I'm going to set an in point. I'm gonna set an out point. And we're going to like play loop playback this section. And I'm going to insert a little bit of ambient reverb here using the studio reverb effect. And the reason for that is that, again, I'm just trying to kind of tweak the room sound of that replaced dialogue because it was obviously done offset, close mic'd, and it just, it just doesn't sound quite right. All right. Now, you got a lot of different settings in here. I'm just going to go through these kind of quickly. All right. First of all, we'll leave the room size at 70. Big kitchen, probably a slightly bigger room. I'll just leave that as the default. That's probably fine. Now, decay, 2,500 milliseconds is way too much. That's 2.5 seconds of, of room echo. That's way too much. Early reflection, this is how much of the reverb you sort of hear almost simultaneously, slightly before as the person's talking, right? When you're in a room, as you say words, things are bouncing off the walls and they're kind of reflecting back. So we want a little bit of that reflection because this is an ambient space. Width is sort of stereo. We don't need any of that. All the dialogue is sort of centered in mono. So we're going to drop this way down. High frequency cut. We're going to do this live. This is, again, how much of that high frequency we're rolling off. This is kind of a mid-rangey kitchen. So it's not super bright. It's more in the mid-range. Similarly, we've got low frequency cut. We can probably leave that at the default. Damping and diffusion, I'll leave those at 50-50. And then the main thing here is playing around with the wet-dry balance. So let me start to kind of tweak through this and let's see what we come up with. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. All right, now already I can hear there's too much echo. There's too much decay. So I'm going to drop that and I'm going to start tweaking this as we go. You just lost it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. All right. So you can see we're starting to add some of those characteristics back in there. I might even drop the wet just a little. But once I add compression on two of those and even out the dynamics, and you saw I turned back on the room tone, I was like, something else is missing. I needed that, that warm room tone. Once I do that, and I might even amplify the warmth on this. And in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut this off, and I'm going to do a slight little fade right here so that this room tone isn't repeated because it's already on the track above. All right, so let's kind of fade this out right as it goes into his other, you just lost it. All right. Got it. You just lost it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. All right. It's probably not coming through super clearly because I know there's like fan noise and whatnot. It's amazing. No. <laughs> It's a good start, okay? So, and this is an inserted reverb. Now, if all of this is seeming sort of complex and scary to you, yeah, it is a little bit of that. And for our last 12 minutes here, this is where we're gonna talk about the ease of using Essential Sound. Okay, so the Essential Sound panel is just that. It lets you perform kind of mixing essentials with a very low lift. Uh, and, and a very, you don't need a lot of audio knowledge to be able to do this. Essentially, the way that it works, essentially, is that you tag the various types of media that you have, all right? In this case, dialogue, music, sound effects, ambience. You tag those clips, and then once you do that, it's going to reveal to you all of the common things that you would often use to process that audio, all right? So for starters, now I could select all of the dialogue here and choose dialogue. This is often what I will do. Now, I, just to 
because I, I'm not, I, we're not gonna have time to go through all of this. Um, let's just choose the first uh, the first guy. So the guy we're looking at there, that's uh, that's Web. All right, right. That is Web, right? Yeah, track to Web. Okay, yes. So we're gonna choose him. All of the uh, rose colored uh, dialogue clips, and we're gonna tag them as dialogue. Now, when we do that, it's going to reveal a whole series of things. Now, there's a lot of stuff in here. We're going to recover this again, recover. We're going to cover this again in another episode. I want to talk very briefly about a couple of these. We're going to focus on two today. The first one is auto match loudness. All right. Now, this is wonderful if you have a whole series of dialogue clips that are for the most part at sort of differing levels. Remember I talked about the ADR was very quiet but the uh, like the boomed audio was sort of nominal, normal. All right, what that does, auto match, is it analyzes using AI and it goes, okay, this is here, this is here, this one's here, this one's here. This is also very useful with multiple actors, right? Multiple actors, different levels of amplitude in their speech. So it analyzes all of them and then it just kind of makes them all about the same apparent loudness, okay? loudness, the way that we perceive them. Now, you might think, why don't I always do this? Well, for one, this stuff was already, it's already been kind of processed. I didn't get the original master. So some of this has been tweaked. Some of it was tweaked outside of Premiere in the, in the first place. It's a good process and I recommend you trying it out. Here's the cool thing about it. It's a single button click, just like that. Where I use this the most, now I don't necessarily use it for dialogue because if I'm recording the dialogue, I know where I'm at. <laughs> I don't want anybody messing with my amplitude but me. Music, however, if you're going to have, again, creepy, doo -doo 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 -doo, all this weird stuff that I've got down here, some of it, my buddy Fred, you can just see these tracks. They're mixed, super, super hot, right? And then I recorded these choirs. I, these are not as hot. You just look at, just look at the, the density of the waveform, okay? Auto matching loudness on music is very useful because, you know, again, you'll cut to a scene and maybe it's, creepy ambient music like this, you know, ominous kind of sounding. But then the next scene is driving down the highway and it's like, you know, some rock music. Well, if the, if all of your music tracks are like, again, depends on where they're coming from, where they're sourced, maybe you have classical, maybe you have jazz, maybe you just have single note ominous. Dun. Now you're, you're being forced to have to adjust levels a lot more manually. If you use auto match on music, it just automatically analyzes everything and says, okay, everything's kind of at the same basic loudness level. You still have to tweak how much of it you want in the scene, but it, it just it just makes it a lot easier, okay? So that's what auto match loudness does. All right, repair. Again, we're not gonna get into this today because I'm gonna do a whole separate thing on noise reduction and hum reduction and rumble removal. Here's the amazing thing about this. This will remove ambient noise, fan noise, air conditioner noise, onset, hums and things, anything that's consistent with a single slider. That's all you need to know about these. I'm not gonna showcase these today, but that's all you need to know, all right? This is awesome. You don't need to know anything about, well, what's what frequencies is it? Um, you do need to understand that noise is all the things I just described. That's what that type of noise is. So like HVAC, again, air conditioner, fan, even a, a, a it could be a car motor or some kind of motor you might have to use a combination of noise reduction and rumble reduction. Rumble is going to be very low frequency noise. D-hum is just that. And you'll see this is specific. This is not motor hum because someone's like, yeah, well, my motor purrs. It's not what I'm talking about. 50 cycle, if you're on, as we say, you know, the other side of the pond. 60 cycle, if you're on this side of the pond, okay? This is specific to removing uh, electrical hum. You can overdo this very easily, but it's a single slider. So you just adjust it until you hear it gone. DSing, that's removing sibilance, right? Very commonly, particularly with boom recordings or lav recordings. Someone's talking on camera, you're doing an interview, and every time they say Tennessee, it feels like your eardrum is being sliced with a knife. You need some sibilance attenuation. That's what DSing does, all right? And then reduce reverb is what I described before. It, it kind of takes the edge off of some room ambience, all right? The one we're gonna focus on right now though 
is clarity. And specifically, this is around dynamics. Now, I, I, I pulled up this little overlay for you. I'm not gonna be able to get into how to set compression manually today, but if you wanna learn more about how to use a manual compressor, whoops, wrong, wrong direction. It's there, ah, there. Bit.ly slash Jace compression. This will take you to a fairly old video of mine. Now, I'm probably going to have to watch it at 1.5x because it was from a live stream. It is not chapterized and it's long. But you watch this, you will know how to set an audio compressor precisely. Okay? A lot of people that I know in the biz have used that very tutorial and then made their own using my exact language. I just take it as a compliment because it is, in fact, flattery, as they say. Bit.ly slash Jace Compression, you'll know what I'm talking about. Here, you don't need to know anything about setting a compressor. It's a single slider. So let's zoom back out here. And on this dialogue, I'm going to turn on dynamics. Okay, now these are short clips, so we're going to have to listen sort of carefully. All right, let me actually here, I'll do an in to out on this. All right, we're gonna just uh, highlight this I don't one, even dude. have any of the money. A Amy just, she split and took it all. She... All right, so we're gonna do an in to out, and I'm gonna start adjusting that dynamic slider, and I want you to hear how it's just gonna start to push that dialogue forward. All right, take a listen. But Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. A Amy just, she split and took it all. She... What? But Dwayne, I, 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 I don't turn even it have off. any Ready? of the money. A Amy just, she split and took it all. She... But Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. Amy just, she split and took it all. She... <sighs> okay. Now, you might be thinking, well, it just sounds like it's louder. It is louder. But more importantly, this is using, I've said it many times, some of the best AI, some of the best machine learning that we have in all of our products. Because what it's doing is it's analyzing not just the amplitude, but it's analyzing the threshold, the point at which compression begins for the entire clip. And then it's dynamically applying this compressor to it. So it's not only just making it louder, but it's keeping it from distorting and it's bringing it more into focus. Now, where this really comes into play is when you start using what's known as ducking, right? Because remember, we've got this music underneath here. But Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. A Amy just, she split and took it all. She... Now let's kill it, ready? But Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. A Amy just, she split and took it all. She... But Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. A Amy just, she split and took it all. She... All right. Notice how it's kind of just sitting on top of it very, very comfortably, very, very nicely. All right, I'm going to select the other three here, and I'm going to do that same level of compression, about 6.8. So they all have the same level of dynamics. Now, that sounds good in and of itself, but we still need to bring that music down just a little bit. And specifically, when he's talking, we want it to dip down. Maybe a little bit. Now, you can do that with a fader. By the way, notice we adjusted amplitude without touching the mixer. We're not touching the faders. We're just using that slider. This is another reason why you want to attenuate those faders before you start to give yourself more headroom. If you see things going into the red here above zero, your stuff is too loud. Drop those faders, okay? Drop them down. We're gonna skip ahead because we've got three minutes here, all right? This is, this is for the fast, for the quick. I'm gonna select both music tracks here, all right? I'm gonna tag these as music and I'm going to turn on ducking, all right? Ducking. What does ducking do? It is automatically, when it, again, AI, senses that something, that there is dialogue. Now, by the way, you can duck against dialogue or other music or sound effects or whatever, all right? When it senses that, it's going to drop the music automatically. The sensing is this sensitivity slider. The duck amount is this is how much it attenuates. And then the fade duration is how quickly it drops down and then how quickly it returns when the person stops talking, all right? So if I play this now, let's click on generate keyframes. All right, it's doing its thing. And if you look, you can see that it has automatically basically created a fade curve for you against dialogue. Now, this is again, another example where I'm just gonna very quickly, I'm gonna select our other friend's dialogue here. 
tag it as dialogue, turn on dynamics. I'm going to give him about the same level. He, he was a little bit louder, so I'm going to give him about 5.8. All right. Then I'm going to come back to the music here. And let's regenerate keyframes. Okay. So that it's now ducking against him as well. Let's hope it's doing that. What's it saying? That's fine. There we go. Okay. All right. And if we now take a listen here, let's clear the in to the out. Play it back. But Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. Amy just, she split and took it all. She... If I talk to Amy. All right. Now you can see it's kind of moving in and out a little bit too much. So this is where we want to adjust that sensitivity. So maybe I adjust the sensitivity. Maybe I, sh I uh, shorten the fade duration. And now I'm going to generate keyframes again. And it should reconfigure that momentarily. And you see it just did. It just changed how that works. So now when we play it back. But Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. A Amy just, she split and took it all. She... <laughs> well, I talked to Amy. She... Now, we don't necessarily want it to ramp back up in the silent sections. But the idea is that now you have the ability to do that. You can readjust those keyframes manually and you have complete control. Unfortunately, friends, we are out of time. So much more that I can show you here. Stay tuned for next week. Sound design, lots more audio. We've got the DCC coming up. So have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.